live from the American Riviera in Santa Barbara, California, please welcome the host of Ken Boxer Live, Mr. Ken Boxer. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Ken Boxer Live. I'm your host, Ken Boxer. Tonight joining us this half hour is a true sports legend. Tonight we have the 1977 World Surfing Champion, Sean Thompson. In fact, Sean is considered one of the 10 greatest surfers of all time. He's also been inducted into the International and Southern California Jewish Sports Halls of Fame. Sean Thompson is also a very successful businessman, environmentalist, producer, and author. His new book, The Code, is an amazing book and a must read. In fact, I read The Code this past weekend and found it to be truly inspirational. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But before we do, Let's welcome to Ken Boxer Live, Sean Thompson. Welcome to our show. It's so nice to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Ken. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad you're here because, you know, last week you were just in, inducted into the Jewish Hall of Fame for Southern, in Southern California. Yeah, that's, that's like a minority within a minority. The Jewish surfer. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, say like, you've heard of surfer dude, what about surfer Jew? No. <laughs> are there many? I don't even know. No, there's not, there's not so, many of us out in the lineup. We're like a secret tribe. <laughs> in fact, are you the first surfer that made it into the Jewish Hall of Fame? No, I'm not. There's actually um, this famous Jewish surfer called Gidget. <laughs> she was the first. <laughs> well, that's we've in Southern it. California. Then uh, I was inducted into the... Um, <clears throat> the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in, in Israel, which was a wonderful experience. And I was inducted with Mark Spitz, the legendary um, Olympian, whose uh, record stood for so many years, seven gold medals, until um, uh, Phelps just beat him. But it, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, like religion tying up with sport, it's, it's kind of different. <laughs> I mean, here you are, though. Um, a, I say a legend. Every, I was doing my research on you, and everyone talks of you as being a legend. You've been, <laughs> do you ever remember yourself not surfing? I mean, well, you know, I, I can remember myself not surfing, but uh, I can't really remember when the beach wasn't part of my life. My earliest memories are of my mom and dad taking uh, me down the beach when, uh, before I could even walk. You know, they set me up under an umbrella in the sand, and, and the beach was always a part of my life, my brother's and sister's life. So my father had loved the beach all through his life. He had been a famous swimmer. He was a famous competitive swimmer and uh, loved the beach life and uh, was training for the Olympics. He, he wanted to be an Olympian. His hero was Juka Hanamoku, who was a famous Hawaiian uh, Olympian. And um, the Olympics was 1948, 1946. <clears throat> he was out uh, surfing with a little wooden board and a Zambezi shark came up from under him and nearly bit his arm off and that was the end of his, his swimming career. But it, he never lost his, um, his love for the ocean and his passion for the ocean. And I think he imparted that onto us, even though he'd had this terrible setback, he'd had this shock that, that nearly killed him and destroyed his career, he, he always imparted that love for the ocean onto us. But in your book, you mentioned that, that uh, even with the attack, you would think that some parents would say, oh, you're not going into, you, they're gonna put their kid in the water after an attack. You actually um, talk about that in the book as, as something that you were questioning at the time about your father doing that, right? Well, I, I, you know, being a dad now, I have a four-year-old son, Luke, and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, if I got nailed at my local beach, Butterfly Beach, and uh, like nearly died, <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't be in such a hurry to take Luke down and sh you know, teach him how to swim right there. But my father had that uh, view um, of life that uh, you can't just look over your shoulder and you can't let uh, misfortune define you. And uh, he never did. He never really thought of, because he couldn't never really move his arm and his arm was sort of shrunk into a fist where the shark had just ripped his bicep. But he never saw himself as uh, disabled in any way. He just had this huge uh, life energy and he was filled with optimism and just had this amazing love for the ocean. And then even though what had happened to him was a, um, obviously, you know, was terrible for him, he still uh, encouraged me and he wasn't one of these like, sports dads, you've got to do this, you've got to win, you've got to win. But I loved to compete and win for him as much as I did um, for myself. So we had this wonderful uh, relationship and together we had this wonderful relationship with the ocean. Well, we're going to see that relationship, by the way, with you in the ocean 
because you brought a clip with you. In fact, you brought a few. So set us up with what we're about to see because we're going to kind of narrate. Actually, you're going to be able to narrate through it. Let's, we can go to that clip. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> the clip uh, was taken in Hawaii. Okay, hold, let's go to the clip right now and you can talk over and we sure. can see what, what it is. Let's watch Sean Thompson. So this is riding inside the tube at a place called Off the Wall. This was sort of the first really in-depth inside the tube photography by, by a, a local Santa Barbara guy called Dan Merkel. And this is Off the Wall. This is a wonderful day because the surf is perfect and there's myself and a guy called Rabbit Bartholomew who also became a world champion. It was just the two of us in the water. And this is kind of really what uh, uh, I think I like to focus on my surfing, which was tube rides and huge carving maneuvers. I love to carve. And this wave was uh, considered one of the greatest waves of, of, of all time with Mark Richards, who was a four times world champion. We both get in the tube together and it was a wonderful wave. It was one of the greatest waves of, of my life. It's very rare when you get in the tube with someone. So I like those big carves and pipeline. Uh, we tried to introduce a new type of, um, of tube riding, uh, riding with your back to the wave at Pipeline and reverse <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long, let me tell you, that was a really long, long time ago. And um, I've got to tell you, I don't, I don't live in the past. I live in the present and I, I think of the future all the time. But, you know, sometimes it's good to look back and, and kind of see, um, see, uh, see what you did so long ago. <laughs> but you were an innovator back then. I mean, reading the book, we talk, you talk about that, that uh, you had new ideas like riding into the tube. You did something that was different than other people. Yeah, what I tried to do is I tried to... Um, riding inside the tube is, is the most amazing sensation, I think, in sport. It feels like time's expanded. It feels like time has actually slowed down, like that wave is actually moving in slow motion. You're absorbing so much information so fast. Um, and on the very, very best moments, it feels like you can actually control the wave. I mean, that's how in touch with your senses and connected you are between mind, spirit and, and, and the ocean. It's just really this most amazing um, sensation. So I really focused on trying to maneuver inside the tube, actually ride the wave inside the tube, as opposed to just threading a needle in a straight line, which was the popular style back then. And it's just a function of, of I think, who I am as a person. I love new projects. I love doing new things. I love challenging myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm I mean, surprised though when, when I'm watching you, I mean, on that clip, when we met before the show, you know, you're a relatively uh, tall gentleman. You're, what, 6'2", 6'3", something like that? 6'1", yeah. 6'1". Now, did, is that an advantage on, on the board being that tall? Because yeah. I would have thought, I was expecting to see someone smaller because you'd think someone with more balance is going to be closer to the ground, so to speak. Well, I think the ideal size for a surf is about 5'8". That's the height of Kelly Slater, who's won 11 world titles and the greatest surfer of all time. So that's the ideal height. So uh, the, being tall can be, uh, can be an advantage. It can be a disadvantage. And I think you can use the leverage. Uh, Mark Richards, uh, four times world champion, one of the greatest surfers of all time, was six foot. But most surfers are, are relatively uh, small blokes. Um, but it's not really an advantage or disadvantage. I mean, Laird Hamilton, the, one of the greatest big wave riders of all time, is about 6'3". So um, I suppose size is an advantage, um, you know, in the real big stuff. Well, when you were in competitive surfing, how did you get an edge up on your competitors? What did you have to do? Was it psychological? Was I it think, um, physical? I think, it's, I think it's, you know, there's a commonality in all sport, whether it's tennis, golf, no matter what it is, boxing, commitment. You have to be absolutely 100 committed to success. And then I think you have to love and have fun with what you're doing. And I think when you have those two things side by side, you can achieve greatness in sport. Without having that ongoing passion on a day-to-day -day basis, that love for what you're doing, you're never going to have that commitment and forward drive for success. But those two aspects have to live together. Well, you talked earlier about your father being an influence in your being in the ocean and the surfing. How much of your success was driven to be successful for your father? You know, I think both my mother and father were, were both instrumental in my success in different ways. Um, my father really saw surfing and sport as a metaphor for life. He would, and he really believed in the Olympic ideal. He would say to me, Sean, when you win, win like a gentleman. And when you lose, lose like a man. It was simple. When you lose, there's no crying and tears and oh, I should have, would have, could have. It's like cop the loss and move forward. So it was a really simple lesson. Win like a man, lose like a man, win like a gentleman. It was like really simple, you know. Be humble in victory. And um, 
I've always followed that ethos that I've got. It's kind of like my father. knowing how to lose can better prepare you to win. You'll, I think so. You'll like I mean, it better. You know, winning and loss, it's they're intimately connected because in surfing there's this variable of the ocean, there's a luck factor. So you're going to you're going to lose a lot of heat, um, and you just got to you know cop the loss, learn from the loss, and move forward, and never look over your um, your, your shoulder. So I learned that from um, definitely learned that from my father. You know, from my mom. I learned about faith, I learned about prayer, because I've been in some situations in the surf, and let me tell you, I've prayed to God that he would not let me die. I want you to hold on to that thought, because I want to go to a clip, and then after that, I want to, because they're going to see some pretty amazing, harrowing things you, that you've <laughs> done. So I'd like to come back and talk about that, just how you did pray to God to uh, keep you afloat. <laughs> Let's go to the clip. Let's watch Sean Thompson. You know, I think everyone was starting to experiment a little bit with equipment. You know, Sean on that blue spider Murphy board with the yellow O'Neill wetsuit was pioneering, you know, the, the depth that you could ride in the tube but off the wall. just sort of taking off and you'd set up the tube, follow that line and hopefully you'd come out, you know? And you were breaking your, your tracks, you were going up and down and you're actually surfing very similar to how the guys surf now in the tube, you know? When you get into a deep barrel, it certainly feels like time's expanded, like life has slowed down. I felt that I could curve that wall to my will. I really felt that. It's a magical, magical moment. It's an incredible moment. My God, he changed the way we rode tubes at, off the wall. It, like all of us at the time, we were thinking about what we could do to leave our mark. And Sean, you know, had a huge influence of, of the involvement of modern day tube riding. He's doing things on single fins in the 70s that, uh, you know, a lot of guys aren't doing on their thrusters now. Just unbelievable modern, way ahead of its time barrel riding. John Thompson, our guest this half hour on Ken Boxer Live. Now, watching that clip, it's not only beautiful to watch you go through that on that wave, but it's also frightening. And you were alluding to that. Talk about how frightening it is and what you're praying to God well, for you know, your safety. I was, I was never really that, that frightened uh, inside the tube. I knew once um, I had this experience at, at the Banzai Pipeline, which is the most dangerous wave in the world. I think about 18 people have died there. And, you know, people every winter during the big surf season that runs from uh, October through March. Um, you know, have these <clears throat> huge west swells that converge on this very shallow coral reef and just break with unbelievable ferocity. And they're very steep, and they call it pipeline because it resembles a pipe, and banzai because that's what the kamikaze pilots used to say when they used to bomb the American <laughs> aircraft carriers because it was like suicidal. So uh, there's, I had this one wave years ago, many years ago, I mean decades ago, and I remember I dropped into this wave, and you can take a wave on, they call it taking off on the second reef, which is like very far out. And as the wave uh, comes in towards the first reef, it gets shallower and shallower and shallower, and I dropped into this huge wave, it was about a 15 foot wave, and I did this bottom turn, and I started to run across the inside reef where it's shallow and jagged. And as I started running across the reef, the wave got bigger and bigger, and I started to get further and further back in the tube. And the, what happens is when you're inside the tube, <clears throat> it's like this long tunnel that just telescopes ahead of you. And you can see the light, and it's like you're riding through this carved glass cylinder. And it telescopes away, and then as you move faster forward, you, you feel you're going to come out, and then it telescopes away. And as I rode further and further and further, I could see the surface of the water getting darker and darker and darker. And it was getting darker and darker because it was getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And... <clears throat> There's a place near the end of the ride where it's about three foot deep, and I was in about a 15 foot wave, and I knew that if I didn't make it over the edge onto the sandy part, I would die. I, I knew in my mind, and I remember as I was riding along inside this barrel, it was so big I was just standing up with my back to the wall, and I, and I said, please God, don't let me die. 
please, God, don't let me die. And, and I was just sort of, oh, and I went, and I asked her, you know what happened to me when I prayed? This is amazing. The wave went, whoosh, and this huge steam and compressed air shot me right over this deadly part of the coral onto the sand. And you know what that was? That was God's breath. That was the breath of God that saved my life. It was amazing when I think about it now. And you know why? I only just thought about that two days ago when I was uh, inducted into this Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. I was trying to find something to talk about. And I thought, wow, you know, that connection between God and surfing, it actually was profound. And I, and I felt it then. But I never spoke about, it. I spoke about it at the induction. But I thought that this was amazing, this connection. Yes, but right after that experience, you went right back in. I went right you? back in, yeah. We were, we were a very um, motivated, crazy. We were committed. <laughs> no, we weren't crazy. I, was, I think I was very calculated in my, uh, my surfing. And underlying it was this passion. You know, I'm still so passionate about my surfing. I spent four hours in the, I had a four hour session today at a, at a, at a, a wonderful break with eight guys in the water just north of here, about six feet. Surf so was six feet in perfection. So I'm, I still love my surfing. I'm, I'm still as passionate about it now, I, I think, as I was then, even though I don't. I can't spend as much time in the water. I have my four-year-old and my, my beautiful wife and business interests and more sorts of things happening, but I still love getting out there. Well, we want to watch more of you performing. We're going to go to another clip, and when we come back, we want to talk about the book. Okay, so can you set us up with what we're about to see on this clip? It's from a movie that you were working on. Yes, sir. I, I made a film uh, a number of years ago. We premiered at the Santa Barbara Film Festival with Jeremy Gosh. Um, who was the director of the movie, it was called Busting Down the Door, and it was about a year in 1975 that changed surfing. It was about a group of six guys, Aussies and South Africans, I was one of them, and how we went to Hawaii with a dream of uh, one day becoming professional surfers and, and how we made that dream come true. Okay, let's watch Sean Thompson. You had this irrational group of kids, and they came over here from Australia, and they came over here from South Africa. It was obvious very early in the game that these new guys were coming along and they could surf better than anyone else in the world. We just wanted to be the best. We wanted to be the most radical. We wanted to do the new maneuvers. They were the next guys that were going to move the sport to the next level. We were prepared to die here and be surfers. That's what it took. The whole little group of Aussies came over here and it was like, just tear apart anything, catch anything. <laughs> just whatever it's moving, just rip it to shreds, you know? This new group came along and said, we want to make surfing into a sport. And everyone turned around and just went, they want to do what? This brash attitude of, screw the establishment, we're going to go for whatever it takes to get what we want. It rubbed people the wrong way in Hawaii, without a doubt. This whole thing of trying to break in and establish a sport, it took a very, very strong attitude. I did not see pro surfing coming until I stood on the beach with Rabbit Bartholomew. It was our chance to change the perception of what the world for surfing was. They did it for nothing, you know, they did it just for the, the love of surfing. They were rerouting the railroad of uh, surfing history. It's timeless stuff, you know, it's stuff that will probably never be repeated. They were the pioneers that laid the foundation for everything we were dreaming about. It was those guys who made pro surfing happen. That everyone in surfing should recognize that, I think. I said, mate, I'm going to be a pro surfer. I'm taking this dream and I'm going for it. Thank you. So that was, that was such a fun movie. We premiered here at the, the Santa Barbara Film Festival. That beautiful song, Dreamers, was written by a group of young Santa Barbara kids called Them Terribles. Great, great song. I found the song outside my door. It was just lying outside my door. We, we were figuring out, like, who should we use for the last song? Because we had David Bowie was in the movie, Iggy Pop, Leonard Cohen, like, who should we use for the last song? And Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam offered us a song. And, and then I find this little, little CD outside my door, and I go and play, and I go, wow, this song. This is it. <laughs> hey, let me, you know, people may think they're learning a lot about you during this show, but I got to tell you, there's, they really want to learn about you. They've got to pick up this book, The Code. I read it this weekend. And I found out, as I said in the intro, inspirational. What had you writing this book? Talk about this book. It's an amazing book. Well, this book, I think, is the best project I, I, I've ever done. Uh, this book is inspired by young people 
and it's written to empower young people to make positive choices. The single biggest problem in our society today that kills more people than anything else, that kills more people than all the world wars combined, every year is poor choices. A million people in America die every year from poor choices. About 25,000 young people die every year from poor choices. I lost my beautiful 15 and a half year old son to a poor, poor choice. So this book has a simple exercise in it and it empowers positive choice. It's not my recipe for success or my recipe of how to live a life. It's just my story and inside that story is a simple exercise that any, any young person can do to empower positive choice. It's very simple, 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And it's called your power code. You write your own power code. And it's 12 promises you make to yourself. And then if you have a friend in need, share it with your friend or just send it out into the universe. I have tens of thousands of young, young, young people doing this power code now, sending it to me, sending it out into the world. I speak to, I don't know, maybe 100,000 young people every year at schools all over the country about uh, positive choices. And uh, it's interesting, I speak about similar material to some of the biggest corporations in the world, from General Motors, Cisco down, about this uh, two things, positivity and self-empowerment. And uh, it's very gratifying to see that, um, that I think it's touching people's hearts. Because we're all so busy today, you know, we've got cell phones, and t you know, it's like everything's happening, but those moments of introspection are so rare. When you just sit down for half an hour, and I say to the, to, to the young people when I speak to them at schools, I spoke last week to this wonderful school in Oceanside, to Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, and I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to write your own code, and I want you to remember one thing from the surfer guy that came and spoke to you. I said, think twice. Because <clears throat> when you're young, you don't realize the gravity of your decisions. You don't realize that one simple decision can kill you. Um, so I say, just remember this. You're going to remember a surfer guy came and showed you some cool video and asked you to write a code, and he asked you to remember this one thing. What is it? Think twice. And they say, I say, what did I say? Think twice. And that's my mission. My mission is to do two things, is help young people and uh, help companies you know, get back to the core values. And I love, I love doing it. In the book, you mentioned that early on in your life. In your, it must have been your late teens. You were in Hawaii for the first time. You just got, you got, just got wealthy from bar mitzvah money. If yeah. <laughs> all of us, all Jews like myself, we at 13 were getting yeah. this gelt coming in. Um, but you went to Hawaii and you stayed with a friend who w was doing heroin. Yeah, no, he offered me. I was 19 years old. I just finished my first year at university studying economics at, at Natal University. And <clears throat> the, the you know, young guy and his family had offered me a place to stay. And I remember walking up to his room after, after I'd been there a couple of days and uh, walked into his bedroom. And there he was. He had a piece of aluminum foil and powder with a burner underneath. And you know, with a silver pipe and smoking the fumes. And I said, what's this? And he said, it's called chasing the dragon. Chasing the dragon. I'd never heard that term. You know, it's sort of a, it's sort of got something romantic about it, chasing the dragon. I said, but, but what is it? He said, it's heroin. And I went, whoa. So I had to make that split second decision because I, he said to me, Sean, you've got to try it. All the guys at Pipeline are doing it. Now, Pipeline was the most famous wave in the world, and I aspired to be one of those guys at Pipeline. So, yeah. obviously, you know, there was that pressure there. Like, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? But, uh, I, you know, I'd grown up very anti-drug, and I knew that I could go down that path, and, and, and it could be dangerous. And ultimately, you know, three months later, this poor young guy who was the same age as me died of a drug overdose. It was terrible. But, um, but somehow that, you were able to see the difference. Yeah, that chapter is called I Will Be Myself. And that was inspired by a young girl, Elena Alcero, who was at school at Anacapa School. And, and I first went to Anacapa School and I spoke to them and I asked them to, those kids to write the code. And they wrote their codes, they sent them back to me, and that's the inspiration for this book, The Code. And the very first line, 80 kids, I got back about a thousand lines of code from these kids. The first line was I will be myself from this young girl. And, and I thought, wow. It's so inspirational, those simple words, I will be myself. I thought, I've got to write a book about this. So that book is actually just inspired by the codes of, of young people framed around my personal experiences. So I'm hoping that I can, it's my mission to get this little exercise in every school in the country. It's free, doesn't cost a cent. 
It costs 30 minutes of time. 12 lines, every line begins with our will. It's cathartic, it's empowering. And when a friend shares it with another friend, mm -hmm. I think it can create this wave of positive energy that just keeps circling the globe. So that's my mission right now. In the book, you actually have on the back an area where people can fill in the I will, they can, they can do it themselves. Yeah, but you don't have to buy the book to do it. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm not here, you know, obviously I'm very proud of the book and I would love people to read my book, but <clears throat> for me, this exercise is free. It doesn't cost a cent. And I'm send, I just send it out to schools. I send it out to schools. I say, I'd love your kids to do this. And I say, if you want me to come and talk to your kids, it's free. Yeah, but how do you get it beyond like it being a New Year's resolution where people, you know, will say, I'm going to go on a diet or I'm going to work out and they don't. How do you get kids to follow up? I, I, I don't know. You do know, know I, I, I don't know. I just know that um, I got a line of code from this young girl at Anna Kappa School and it inspired me to write a book. And I get so many kids writing to me now and saying, Sean, thanks for writing the book or thanks for coming to our school. Thanks for inspiring me. So if a kid can inspire me to do something, a kid can inspire another kid to do something and a kid can inspire another kid to do something. And ultimately, if one kid's life can be saved, if maybe one kid will think twice or empower another kid to think twice or empower another kid to know that, let's write the code, there's hope. You know, it's our will. It's about the future. It's about hope. So, so I'm hoping that this little exercise can, um, can get out there. I'm, I mean, I'm doing my best, but the kids have got to carry the torch. I mean, I'm just sort of lit the, lit, lit the spark. Um, I'll be remiss if I don't tell our audience that you're going to be out and about during uh, the film festival at a particular show. It's called the a Life Outside. It's a screening, um, Saturday, February 1st, 11 o'clock in the morning, Metro 4 Theater. You'll be there. It's a, about uh, surfing. And um, we've got to let you go. Time's running out. We're so appreciative that you came. Ken, thanks so much for having me. It's awesome. Awesome to be here in Santa Barbara. Uh, <laughs> we, what a great resident we have. You're, you're being here. <laughs> We're so glad you're here and you're on the show. And we hope you um, uh, will come back again. Pleasure. And thanks for, uh, th thanks for helping spread the word to, to young people around the world. Thank you for coming. <laughs> well, that's it for another edition of Ken Boxer Live. Be sure to tune in for our next show as television icon Jerry Mathers, The Beaver. From the hit TV show Leave It to Beaver, fame will be here for the entire half hour. And that ought to be a fantastic show. I know you won't want to miss that. Okay, so for my guest, Sean Thompson, and for my director, Nick Ferretti, and for my entire production crew, the hardest working crew in Santa Barbara, I'm Ken Boxer saying we'll see you next week on Ken Boxer Live. Good night, everybody. <laughs>